My name's Daryl Peterson, and I'm the Applications Engineering Manager at MicroMeasurements. Uh, this video, I'd like to show you or introduce you to some of our newest uh, strain gauges. Um, these strain gauges are manufactured using a process that has been developed over about the last uh, 10 years with our advanced sensors group. Uh, these strain gauges will look identical to a standard or traditional uh, CEA series strain gauge that we use uh, in our workshops and are widely used by customers uh, throughout the industries. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to reproduce uh, one of our workshop uh, beam installations. Uh, this is a, it's a piece of 2024 T4 aluminum. We install a CEA 13 uh, 250 UW 120 strain gauge onto the aluminum. We attach some wires to it, and then we calculate, we calculate what the strain level should be, and then we connect it to an instrument and measure it and see how they compare. My goal this morning is to reproduce this exercise using the same uh, type of aluminum, 2024 T4, and using a traditional CEA series strain gauge, and then I'm going to compare it to the new strain gauge made by the Advanced Sensors Group. Uh, one of the advantages of using this new processing method is that the resistance tolerances of these gauges should be tighter than what we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, we've done extensive testing of these new gauges and found that the fatigue performance, uh, the operating temperature range, uh, the strain range, that matches the traditional uh, CEA series gauge. So my goal this morning is to install both a traditional gauge and the advanced sensors gauge onto this aluminum beam and then we'll take it and connect it into a P3 strain indicator and we'll see how close they match. So let's get started. <clears throat> I'm going to use the micromeasurement CSM3 uh, degreaser as the first step to degrease the beam. It could have a little bit of oil on it, uh, maybe just some surface contamination. And the first step in prepping the surface is to degrease. So I'll just take the cap off the CSM3 and I'll take one of these gauze uh, sponges and I like to take it and fold it and then fold it in half again and spray that directly into the gauze pad. And then I'll just take it and wipe along the top surface of the beam and under or on the uh, the underside and kind of clean the edges and just basically just give it a good thorough degreasing. Once I've done that I'll take that and discard it. The very next step is going to be to dry braid the surface of the beam. So we're going to use two different types of silicon carbide paper. I've got a 320 grit that I'm going to start with first. You'll notice it's a wet or dry sandpaper. Uh, very typical for like wet or dry sandpaper that you'd use for like prepping the surface of a car for paint. Uh, we like to use 320 grit as a beginning point on this aluminum and then we'll follow it up with a 400 grit and that'll leave about the right surface finish on this piece of aluminum to get a good bond with our adhesive. So I'm going to start with the 320. I'll just take it out, open it up. I'll take a piece that's about an inch and a half long. I'll take the rest of it, put it back inside of that. And I like to take it and fold it in half like that so you have a little friction for your finger. And then the gauge installation on this beam, there's a little tick mark on the side. The gauge is going to be installed about two inches away. Actually, both gauges are going to be installed about two inches away from this end of the beam. And down here is going to be the load point. And we can tell that because we've got a little tick mark that tells us. So I'll just abrade back and forth somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 strokes. And then once I've done that, the very next step, I'll discard that piece. The very next step is going to be to do a wet abrade. And with the wet abrade, I'm going to use a 320 grit paper as well, but this time I'm going to combine it with the red tip bottle, the in-prep conditioner. So what I'll do is take the conditioner, I'll open it up, put a few drops on the surface, close it back up, and then take another piece 
of this silicon carbide paper and again fold it. Put the rest of it back inside the little packet. And then I'll abrade back and forth. Again, about eight to 10 strokes. What you're trying to do is lift off contamination and you're also trying to introduce a uniform texture. We want some texture for that adhesive to be able to bite to it. Now, once I've done that, I'll take another gauze pad. And this time I'm gonna dry up what's left on the surface of the beam. So I'll take it and start inside the cleaned area. Use a single wipe. You'll notice I picked up quite a bit of contamination off the surface. I'll take it and I'll refold it to a clean side. Start inside that cleaned area and go the opposite direction. So right now we're making progress. So we've introduced the 320 grit paper, we've done a dry braid, we've done a wet braid. The next step is gonna try to get that surface finish a little bit smoother, and that's where we're gonna use the 400 grit wet or dry sandpaper. So what I'm gonna do is just take my scissors and just cut one end of that open. I'll close it, take that, throw it away. And again, I like to uh, tear it at the fold. That's about the right length of uh, paper. I'll tear that, take the rest of it, close it back up, put it back inside of that vinyl packet so I can find it later. And then I'll take another few drops of the conditioner. And again, the 400 grit paper and then I braid back and forth. I'm going a little slower just because it's in the camera, but I braid back and forth about eight to 10 strokes. And then once you've done that, again, take another piece of the gauze pads inside the cleaned area using a single wipe, and then take it and refold it. Start at the same spot and go in the opposite direction. Now at this point you'll notice that some of the paper's gotten wet, so what I'm going to do is discard the top couple of sheets of paper just so I'm going to work on a cleaner surface or a drier surface for the next few steps. And really the next step for us is to introduce a, a line so that we can position the strain gauge. And aluminum is soft enough that we can introduce a line using a 4-H drafting pencil. Most folks don't draft these days by hand, but back in the old days, folks used uh, paper drafting, or they used paper drafting techniques in these types of pencils. 4-H, it's gonna have a harder lead in it, although it's not lead anymore. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this beam and look to the side and transfer the marks on the side up to the top surface, just like that. Okay, and then once I do that, I'm gonna take a straight edge. I'm gonna lay that right across this area. I'll take the pencil and I'll press down firm and I'm trying to burnish a line right in the area where I want the strain gauges to be installed. Just like that. Now once I've done that, I also want to, to create a line down here where the load is going to be uh, positioned. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm also going to transfer, you can, you can see these tick marks on the side of that beam as well. I'll just transfer them up with the drafting pencil. And then this time I'm going to use a dental pick to scribe these lines. Actually, it's just going to be a line. So I'll take it and I'll scribe it. Just like that so that we can accurately position the weight. Now, once you've gotten to this point, you're ready to continue cleaning. We need to get all the graphite and wax off the, the beam, so we'll use some more conditioner. I'll take it and just kind of flood it around that. And then I'm going to use these cotton tip applicators. These are basically Q-tips with a wooden handle. And to open them up, I'll take the scissors. And I'll just open it at the handle end. OK, 
take that, throw that away, and then take one of these cotton tip applicators, and then I'll scrub it. And you want to scrub right along the axis of the line first, because you're trying to minimize how much of the graphite and wax and whatever else is in there flows along the surface of the beam that you're trying to clean. And as one side starts to come up uh, with some of that contamination, then just take it and roll it around to a clean side, and then scrub that area. Sometimes you'll find you'll have to use two of them, so I'll throw that one away and grab another one. And the cotton tips have a tendency to absorb quite a bit of moisture, so sometimes you gotta add a little bit more conditioner. Take that, close it, and then scrub that surface. And you should be able to scrub this until this thing, this cotton tip comes up just about clean. You're using an etchant, so most of the time it'll have a little bit of a grayish tint to it. Once you're happy with that, take another gauze pad, fold it. Take it and refold it for a clean side, and then go in the opposite direction. And then the last step to get this beam ready is going to be to scrub it with the Imprep Neutralizer. This is an ammonia-based solution. Uh, the conditioner is a very mild phosphoric acid. It helps to chemically etch, and it also drops the pH. And some of these adhesives, in particular the one that we're going to use this morning, which is Embon 200, uh, is a cyanoacrylate. And cyanoacrylates do not like to stick to a surface that has a low pH. So if you introduce a conditioner, you've got to introduce the neutralizer. So before I do that, I'm going to clean off my work surface again, make sure we're working on a, a drier sheet, or at least in a drier section on the piece of paper. What I'm going to do is slide it down here and take the neutralizer, a couple of drops, close it up, and then take the cotton tip applicator and give it a good scrub. And you can see now it's coming up nice and clean. If, <clears throat> if your tips come up contaminated at this point, you probably missed a step somewhere in the process. So give it a good scrub. And then again, another gauze pad, take it and fold it. Start inside the cleaned area, single wipe through the target, and then take it and refold it. Start inside that cleaned area and go the other direction. And at this point, this beam is ready for bonding. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it, move it to the side, and I'm also gonna make sure we're working on a clean, dry sheet of paper. Okay, so now we have the aluminum beam uh, prepped and now we're going to focus on our work surface that we're going to use to position the strain gauges. Uh, we're going to clean that off. And let me show you the gauges. So I've got two of them. And at first glance, it's very difficult to tell the difference between these gauges. Uh, this first one, this is a traditional uh, CEA series gauge. This one happens to be a CEA uh, 13 250 UW 120 and we've been building CEA strain gauges since the early 1980s and the reason they're so popular is that they have a protective film over the grid of the strain gauge and they also have larger copper coated tabs to make uh, lead wire attachment uh, much easier. If we look at the details for this uh, CEA series gauge you'll see that it has a resistance of 120 ohms plus or minus 0.3 uh, the gauge factor is 2.120 plus or minus a half percent. Transverse sensitivity is 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 percent. And this is the uh, coefficients for the thermal output for this gauge. So we test them, since they're a 13 compensated gauge, we test them on 2024 T4 aluminum and we establish what, what the gauge generates as a function of a temperature change when the aluminum is allowed to freely expand and contract and we give you that data. So you can take that and plug it into your data acquisition or you can plug it into a spreadsheet and plot it. 
Uh, the gauges are from that foil lot. This work order information helps us track it where it goes through production. If you wanted to order more of these, you could either use the gauge designation down here at the bottom, or you could use the item code. Either way, our customer service department can uh, determine what you're looking for. Uh, in a pack of these gauges, there's five pieces, and that's a date code of when they were manufactured. And all of this information is contained on this 2D barcode. So if you have a barcode reader or scanner, you could shoot that and automatically pull in this data um, into your data acquisition system or into your logging system. Uh, the second strain gauge is this one. And if you look at it, it really looks identical. It's, uh, it's also encapsulated. It's made out of a cast polyamide backing, just like a traditional CEA series gauge. It's got a film overlay over the grid to help to protect it from me and you while we're trying to install it. It's got large copper-coated tabs, identical in size to the other gauge. So really, this gauge is a drop-in replacement. Now, in this particular case, this one is a 350 ohm resistance, where the one that uh, we've been using for many years is a 120. So that's one of the changes that we're going to make coming up in our workshops is to switch over to a 350 ohm strain gauge. If we look at the data sheet that's provided with it, you'll notice much of the same information and really this should be a drop-in replacement. We've got the resistance, temperature coefficient, gauge factor, transfer sensitivity, all the coefficients, as well as the foil lot, and then the item code, and then the part number. And when you look at this strain gauge, the only difference you'll see in the gauge designation is an A that we add after the, the W. This is a CEA 13 250 UW. This particular one's 350. Um, and we're gonna switch over to the higher resistance gauges because we find that, quite frankly, more of our customers use 350 ohm strain gauges these days than they do 120s. So with that being said, let's do a little bit of house cleaning. So one of the first things I'm gonna do is take the neutralizer and I'll just take a few drops of it, put it on the piece of glass like that and I'll take a gauze pad and I'm just going to fold it and clean off this surface because this is the surface we're going to use to prepare and position the string gauge. And the other thing I'm going to do is take my, my tweezers, the ones that I'm going to use to handle the gauges, and I'm just going to kind of clean those off. Just clean off the tips of them using a gauze pad and some neutralizer. And then the basic idea is that we're going to take these two gauges, I'm going to try to lay them out one at a time on the piece of glass, put a piece of handling tape over top of it, and I may have to trim it because I've got a limited amount of space where these gauges are going to be installed, and I want to have them both as close as I can get them to the middle of the beam and positioned at the same spot because the idea, of course, is to compare the response of these two different string gauges. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the traditional gauge. I'll open up the folder, grab it by the corner. There you can see the bonding side. There you can see the top side. Just like with any other strain gauge, you want to lay it with the shiny side up and the dull side goes down. That's very important. Now, in order to be able to position this gauge onto the aluminum beam, I need to put some tape on it. So what I'm going to use is this, uh, this happens to be PCT2M. Now we've updated to PCT3M, uh, but it's really the same product, product. It's just a different roll size. Uh, what I'm going to do is tear off the first few inches and throw that away because it could have picked up some dust. And then I'll take a piece of tape that's about, yeah, roughly speaking, about four to five inches long. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to go ahead and say that this gauge is going to be on the, the left side. So I'm going to try to capture it so that I get it right over top of it and have it biased. I don't know how well you can see that, but I've got the tape biased right along the edge. And what that's going to allow me to do is now position this other gauge right up near that edge. So I'm going to take that, move it here. I'll take the second strain gauge, and you can go ahead. You don't. You could either do these one at a time, or you can position them both. Either way is fine. 
I'm going to go ahead and position both of them out on the piece of glass about the way they're going to be installed onto the surface of the beam. I have a bigger gap on the glass than I will once I transfer it over. So once that one's in place, I'm going to push these folders to the side. Take another piece of the gauge installation tape, again about four to five inches long. Take that, move it out of the way. And the same thing here. I'm going to try to take this and bias it so that now I've got both gauges captured in the tape and you can see now I've got very little tape that's going to be in between them so I can take these two and I can pos position them close to each other once I transfer it over to the surface. Another thing that I like to do is take the tape and just kind of fold the end of it back over like that, it gives you a little bit of a handle. It makes it a little bit easier to pick the tape up off of the uh, glass. And we're going to orient these strain gauges so that the tabs of the gauges are pointed down toward what will be the load into the beam. And I'll go ahead and start with gauge one. And what, I'll, what I'm planning to do is I'll get the, both gauges transferred over. I'll put one more piece of tape over top of everything and then I'll lift it back, apply the adhesive, and then push it down into place. So I'll just start with the traditional CEA series gauge. I'm going to lift the tape, and as you do this, make sure you lift the tape at a shallow angle. Don't pick it straight up. Lift it at a shallow angle. Once you get past the gauge, then you can go ahead and lift it on up. I'll pick it up, and I'm going to transfer it. over there to the beam like that. Again, I've tried to split it so it's in about halfway. And then we'll do the exact same thing with this second gauge. I'm going to lift the tape again at a shallow angle. And once you get past the gauge, then you can go ahead and pick it on up off the piece of glass. And we're going to position it so that we've got that gauge on there as well. So now I've got both of them installed there. They are both right along that burnished alignment mark. As I'm looking at it, one of the things I've got a little bit more space down here at the bottom than I do at the top, so what I think I'm going to do is scooch them over ever so slightly scooch being a technical term. I'll just pick it up again and I'll move it a little bit closer to that side. That'll just give the other one just a little bit more room. And again, as long as you use the same technique, you can lift the gauge up and move it around and then put it right back down. Once I'm happy with it, pretty even now. As you can see, the two gauges side by side. Again, the load will be down here. I'm going to run one more piece of tape over the top of them, and then we're ready to start applying the catalyst and apply the adhesive. So in order to cover that gap, again, I'll take another piece of tape, about four inches, four to five inches long. Lay it right over the top, like that. Fold the end of it over, and now it's effectively like I've got one relatively wide piece of tape. Now what I'm going to do is just like any other time, I'm going to find my adhesive. I've got the Embon 200. As you know, it comes with two components. It's got the Embon 200 catalyst we put on first, and then the Embon 200 adhesive. This catalyst serves as a control. When you're in very dry climates, it can take longer for cyanoacrylates to cure, so this helps to speed it up a little bit. And it's, when it's very wet, it actually can kick over quicker, and this will help to sort of slow it down. So 
it just basically helps to make sure that this cyanoacrylate will cure. And unlike some manufacturers, we apply the catalyst only on the backing of the strain gauge. And less is more. The less catalyst you use, the better. So let me show you how we'll do that. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just take the tape and I'm going to lift it, pick it up at a shallow angle, and I'll pull it back about, about an extra half of an inch. It's a little bit thicker than normal, so it's kind of wanting to fold back over. But I'll actually, let me show you another little trick. I'll just take it and kind of fold it back like that. And take the catalyst, shake it <clears throat> a few seconds. And then as you take the cap, instead of just going directly to apply it, you're going to put it on way too heavy. So what we ask you to do is take it and touch the inside part of the bottle yeah, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 times. Right. You're, what you're trying to do is put the vast majority of the catalyst right back in the bottle. And the reason for that is the catalyst is 98% isopropyl alcohol. It's the 2% that we need. Most of this is alcohol. Just take it and lay it flat and use a single wipe across the gauges like that and then you need to wait 60 seconds so I'll look at my watch I'm at 24 so now we wait a minute <clears throat> now while we're waiting one of the things I like to do too is to go ahead and get your gauze pad ready because we're going to use this gauze pad as a squeegee so I'll just take it and fold it and then fold it in half again like that have it ready We've got the Embon 200 adhesive. <clears throat> you should always check the date of it. In this particular case, the expiration date is December 2019, so we know it's good. If it's a brand new bottle of Embon 200, if it has, and it usually does have some liquid in the nozzle, what I like to do is squeeze that out. So I'll squeeze a few drops out of it just to make sure that I'm getting fresh adhesive from the main uh, bottle. And this is where you can't shortcut it. If you, What we find over the years is that most people that make a mistake with Embon 200, it's due to the catalyst. They end up putting it on way too heavy and they don't wait long enough. So you got to make sure if you put it on in a real thin film like I did, one minute should be fine. If you put it on and you can tell it's blue, you probably put it on a little too heavy and you need to wait maybe three to five minutes. All right, so once we, and we've gone past our one minute. So what I'm gonna do, since I've got two gauges, I'm gonna go ahead and put maybe two good drops of adhesive right there at the junction of the tape. Probably one would be fine. And you need to move quickly here. So have your gauze pad, take your tape, pull it over, hold it at an angle, and then just push the adhesive underneath the strain gauges all the way out to the end. And as soon as you do that, take your thumb and put your thumb over top of it and you want to keep it on there for a full 60 seconds. So again, checking the watch. I'm at 20. So I'm going to wait a full 60 seconds for this adhesive to cure. Okay, so we waited our one minute of uh, thumb pressure. Uh, typically afterwards, uh, normally we wait one minute of thumb pressure and then we let it sit for two minutes. And after that, the strain gauges should be installed. If, um, you should basically be ready to take the tape off and uh, start soldering. Uh, we're going to use uh, a soldering unit. I'm going to pull it over, and I am left-handed, so I'm going to be coming in from the left side. This unit is a, it's a HACO unit. Uh, we use these in our training program. And what I like to do, instead of using like the sponges that they give you with the soldering unit, we like to use a dry gauze pad. And the first thing I'm going to do is just take a minute here and pin the tip of this pencil. Uh, not sure who was using it before me, but I'll go ahead and take it and tin it. And put that back in the holster so that's ready to go. And we're going to use um, the solder, this is eutectic solder, it's 361A-20R-25. 361 is a melting temperature. The A means it has antimony. The 20 is the diameter of it. R means it has a rosin flux core. 
and then the two five is the length of it. It's a 25 foot spool. So we're ready to go ahead and remove this tape and uh, go ahead and tin the tabs of the strain gauge. So what I'm gonna do is lift the tape and I'm gonna pull it directly back on itself like this. I'm trying to minimize the amount of force pulling on top of the strain gauge. And once you get past the gauge, you can go ahead and take it off. And now's a good time for an optical inspection. Now we wanna take a look at them. Now, did you get the gauges in the right spot? Does it look like that they're down, uh, you know, evenly spaced in this case? And I think they look pretty good. Both are right along that burnished alignment mark. Uh, they're both about the same distance in from the edge. And I would expect to get very similar results between uh, these two strain gauges. And that's what we're here to prove. So once I've got that, the one of the things I'd like to mention before I go further, both of these gauges are encapsulated. So you could go ahead and start soldering the leads onto the strain gauge. You want to tin the tabs first, and then we'll work with the wire, and then we'll connect it on, we'll tape it in place, and we'll finish the connections. Um, if you, Sometimes you'll find that you don't want to use the entire size of the tab, and that's fine. You can take a piece of paper drafting tape and just maybe cover 20 or 30 percent of it to make them a little smaller, and I think I'm going to do that just because sometimes it makes a neater looking uh, solder connection. So I'll just take a piece of paper drafting tape, and since the gauges are placed so well, I can use the same piece of tape to cover up both of them. If these gauges would have been open-faced, you really have to do this, but when they're encapsulated, you really don't. It's purely to make it look better. Now, once you've got the tape in place, you're ready to go ahead and tin the tabs of the gauge. I'll just clean the soldering tip off, feed a fresh pull of solder on it. Take the soldering tip. What I like to do is try to lay the solder right over top of it, the tab, and then press the iron through. Count one, count two, lift it up. And there you go. Now, once you've got those tinned, <clears throat> now you can focus on your wires. And this is one of them. We're going to construct a three wire uh, quarter bridge circuit. I've already prepped these. These have a red, a white, and a black insulated conductor. And since it's a three wire system, I'm going to put the uh, red wire by itself and the black and the white, we twist them together. And these are going to be connected right onto the tabs of the gauge. This happens to be a vinyl insulated 30 gauge wire. It's probably about 18 to 20 inches long. And we're going to use that because that's really all the length that we need uh, for these gauges. Now you'll notice that I've got it stripped, and if I were to just solder it onto the ends here, we'd be concerned about that shorting onto the aluminum. So what we're going to do is we're going to trim that to make it shorter. And ideally what you would find is that the exposed conductor would rest right on top of the solder connections, and the insulation would be on top of the backing on the strain gauge to make sure that you're electrically insulated. So you really trim off most of this exposed conductor and leave probably about a sixteenth of an inch of it left. So I'll do that. So I'll just take my finger, put it over the end, take this, come down to about here, trim it, and I'll compare it. And so yeah, that looks pretty good. It looks about right. And then the other thing I'm going to do is, is take the diagonal cutter and I will nick the insulation between the red and the white conductor. All I'm trying to do here is uh, just give me a little bit more room to kind of move it around if I need to. And this is a point too. This is a point too where you can take your your tweezers and just kind of move move these things around a little bit. And there is no polarity associated with the strain gauge, so you could put the red conductor on the right or the red conductor on the left. I think I'm going to go with the red conductor being uh, on the left. So I'll take a piece of paper drafting tape, 
It's about this long, about an inch or so. Put it up against the edge here. And then I'm going to put a little bit of a curve in it, like that. And the reason I do that is when I flatten it out, it'll have a tendency to push down on the connection and keep these going down into those solder connections. So I'll take that, lay it over top of it, just press it down into place. And it looks to me like they're in about the right spot, so I'll go ahead and reflow the connection on both of those. Doesn't really matter which one you start with. I'll go ahead and start with a red one. There's that one, and then I'll do the black one. And here, this should be very quick, very simple. Press through and lift it up. Okay, and that one has the wire in place, and now we'll move on to the second one. <clears throat> Again, I've already got this wire. I've got it stripped and prepped. I've also tinned it as that one, so uh, it, takes a few extra minutes, but as you're installing gauges, you know, part of it not to forget about is prepping your wire. And that normally means you strip it of the insulation. In this case, we twist some of these conductors together and then we also tin them. So basically this one is ready to go as well. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'll take it and compare it, decide how much of that exposed conductor to trim off. Go down here about a 16th of an inch or so. That was a little bit long, so I'm going to trim it again. That looks about right. So then I will also, again, just like before, I'll nick the insulation between the red and the white conductor. And that just allows me to kind of move things around a little bit. So I'll take my tweezers and I'll kind of shape it a little bit so that it matches up to the tabs of the strain gauge. About like that. Compare it. It's probably a touch on the long side, so let me trim it just one more time. Okay. And then I'll keep the same polarity. I'll keep the red conductor to the left. The white and the black will go to the right. And same thing as before, I'll take a piece of paper drafting tape, roughly about an inch long, doesn't have to be exact. Place it up near the end. And I'll take it and kind of fold it like that. Put a little curve in it. Just like that. And then I'll take it and tape it in place. Press it down so it doesn't move. And it looks like it's in the right spot. So once I get it in the right spot, I'll go ahead and reflow those connections too. Should be very quick, very easy to do this. So that's one of the advantages of CEA series gauges. It is very quick and very easy. Whether you're in a laboratory setting or maybe you're out in the field, Really, either way, it should be that simple and that easy. Now, you might think that you're done at this point, and you are done with the wire connections in terms of connecting the leads on the gauge and prepping the tabs and tending them and all that. But a major part of strain gauge installation is cleaning everything up. So the very next step for us, once we've got the leads in place, is now to start removing this tape and more importantly, remove any residual flux that may have been left behind from the soldering process. So we're gonna do that next. Okay, so now we're ready to use the rosin solvent. Uh, the rosin solvent's used to help dissolve any residual flux that's left over. It also helps to clean the installation up. Um, this particular packaging is for our workshop kits. Uh, we've got it uh, wrapped in an absorbent material and now it's sealed in this plastic bag and I need to open that up. I'll just take a pair of scissors and do that. And once we get this thing out, you'll also notice that it has a white seal to keep the cap from moving during shipment. I'll go ahead and take that off.
rosin solvent is a 50-50 mixture of isopropyl alcohol and toluene. Uh, it's very simple to use, comes with a brush cap applicator, and all that we have to really do is start in and around our solder connections. In this case, we got the pieces of tape, so we're going to use it to help us get the pieces of tape off as well. Uh, as with any chemicals that you're using for gauge installation, you always want to check the, the expiration dates on it, and this has an expiration date of March 2021, so we know we're in good shape. So I'll take the rosin solvent, and I'm just going to start by flooding it over top of the pieces of tape and in and around the solder connections. And this is uh, paper drafting tape, so it should break down pretty easy. That's one of the reasons that we use paper drafting tape is that it's pretty easy to get it off because you're not going to leave it in place normally. So I'll just take it and kind of work it. Once I get that piece of tape off, I will throw it away. And then I'll go to work on these other two pieces of tape. It kind of helps if you can sort of lift it, kind of get it up underneath the edge. That'll get it starting to work. I start breaking down the uh, the mastic on the tape. Sometimes it takes just a minute or two. You can see it's starting to break that one down. You you just kind of work it up underneath the tape using the bristles of the brush. And once you've got it broken down, then you can go ahead and peel it on up. You can use your tweezers if you want to. And I'll continue to work on these pieces of tape to get them off. Now you might be asking, won't you just peel the tape off? It's because you just spent the last half hour putting wires on these strain gauges. The last thing you want to do is to damage a strain gauge just by aggressively pulling off the tape. So you let the rosin solvent help you to get the tape off. I'm going to lift this edge along the side of this beam. Just kind of work it up underneath it. You can see there that it's really starting to attack that piece of tape and that tape's starting to come off. It might take you a minute or two, but you just continue at it. There you go, and once you float it off, you go ahead and remove that one. This one should be ready to come off as well. So now that you've gotten all the tape off, you want to make sure you get whatever mastic is left behind. And you also want to remove any signs of a residual flux. So you want to take the rosin solvent, flood the area in and around the solder connections, up underneath the wire, keep it nice and wet. And then once you get to that point where it's nice and wet, take a gauze pad and just blot it dry. And then basically you turn right around and you do that again. Try to work it up underneath. Be careful as you do this, but work the bristles of the brush up underneath the lead wire, because a lot of times flux, when it gets trapped, it gets trapped right up underneath that solder connection. A little bit of tape residue, looks like it's left on there. We'll get that off here in a second. We'll take it. And then we'll blot it, blot it dry. Now the next thing I'd like to do is add some strain relief for these wires because we don't want to accidentally 
pull off uh, one of these leads as we start, or pull off the tabs of the strain gauge once we start handling these wires. So what I'm going to do is take a handle end of one of the cotton tip applicators and I'll take my pointed tweezers and if you watch this is real simple I'm going to come down about an inch or so away from the strain gauges and I'm going to put a strain relief loop and the way I do that is I just take my tweezers and press down firm about an inch away from the gauges and I'll take this handle end and slide it up and then I'll just rock that over and as I do that what it does is it puts a little bit of a, an inch worm into that wire like that. So once I have, and see what that would do is it, it'll allow for a little bit of slack, if you will, if you accidentally start to tension on the wire, it'll pull that little loop out. So once I have that in place, then I'll take another piece of paper drafting tape and I'm gonna use that to tape these wires down in place. Now paper drafting tape is probably not the best thing you could choose, but for us this is a pretty short-term measurement. We're trying to compare these two gauges and then basically after that we're done. We do sell an aluminum foil tape that works great for this. Uh, you can also use some of our protective coatings to provide strain relief for the wire, but for what we're doing today, uh, that'll be just fine. Okay, so we've got both strain gauges installed on the aluminum beam and now I've connected uh, each one of them into the gauge installation testers. Uh, what this will verify is the electrical integrity of the circuit. We're basically going to look at the initial imbalance. We're also going to look at the resistance to ground. Um, I'll take it and just lay it onto the table. We'll come over to this left gauge installation tester first. This one is testing the traditional CEA series gauge which is a 120 ohm. So I've got the red wire connected to the red post. The white wire in this case goes to the black post and the black wire goes to the white post. It really doesn't matter with these two, the white and the black, because they're common together on the strain gauge. That's just the way I wired it up. With this instrument, first thing you always want to do is check your uh, battery, make sure the batteries are good. And oh by the way, before I forget, Make sure you have the ground connected and we do, it's clipped on to the end of this beam right here. So I'll push the battery indicator and it goes all the way to the right. That's an excellent indication that the batteries are fully charged or the batteries are good, not charged, but good. 5% uh, as I push that, you'll notice that the needle really doesn't move. We're looking at a percent deviation comparing the installed resistance to a resistor inside the box. Notice again at 5% it barely moves. On the 1% scale, it goes up ever so slightly. I would say that's probably about 0.06%. If you remember the tolerance on these gauges from the package, it's plus or minus 0.3%. Uh, we can verify the resistance of the gauge. Sure enough, it does tell us that it's a 120 ohm. And then last but not least, as we push the mega ohm check, uh, we're going up to 20,000 mega ohm, and that's exactly the number that we're expecting and looking for. So we'll do the very same thing with the advanced sensors, 350 ohm strain gauge. I've got the red conductor going to the red post, the white one goes to the black, and this time the black wire goes to the D350 post. Again, you could flip-flop the white and the black, and it's perfectly fine. It works either way. Um, again, the ground strap is connected. Uh, that ties into the end of the beam. We'll check the battery on this box. It goes full scale. That's a good indicator that the batteries are good. 5% range. The needle really doesn't move. To get a little bit more of a uh, indication, we push the 1% range and we're on the order of about 0.12% on the low side. Again, well inside of the tolerance. Uh, we check the resistance of the strain gauge, and sure enough, it tells us that it's uh, 350 ohms. And then last but not least, we look at resistance to ground, and it goes full to 20,000 mega ohm or 20,000 million ohms resistance. So these checks verify that both gauges are well inside of their resistance tolerances. Uh, both have excellent resistance to ground. 
So really the next test is to check their performance. So we'll disconnect them from the gauge installation testers and we'll take them and connect them into our P3 strain indicator. So I'll just take the wires, loosen them up, pull them off. Very simple, very easy, and very quick. Disconnect the straps. This is a little fixture that we use for the workshop. I'll just take the beam and slide it inside. And we're going to connect the standard 120 ohm strain gauge to channel 1. Very simple, the red wire will go to the P plus connection. The white wire, I'm going to use that for S minus. And then the black wire in this case will go to D120. Very simple, very easy. And then on the second strain gauge, on the advanced sensors gauge, we're going to connect it to channel 2. Red wire goes to the red post, or sorry, the uh, P plus connection. White wire goes to the S minus, and then the black one goes to D350. Just like that. And now, basically, we have to set the instrument up, and we'll do that by activating the channels. Let me grab the weight. We have our four pound weight that we'll use to apply a load to the end of this beam, but we also need the engineering data that comes with the strain gauges. We already know the resistances, we've verified that with the gauge installation tester, but we need to know the gauge factor for these. So the, the traditional CEA gauge is 2.120, and then the advanced sensors 250UW is going to be 2.06. So I'll need to input that data into the P3 strain indicator. And just to show you how to do that, <clears throat> and show you how to use this thing, first thing I'm going to do is activate the channels. And right now we have channels 1 and channel 2 active. The other two channels are inactive and I'm going to leave them that way. So I'll press menu to get back out. Second step is to set the bridge type. And these are going to be set up as a quarter bridge for both of them because they're both quarter bridges. I'll press menu to get back out of that. Third step is going to be to set the gauge factor. So for channel 1, I'll just arrow down and arrow across. Gauge factor is 2.120. And I'll just press menu to get back out of that. And then I need to set the gauge factor for channel 2. I'll come down, go over, and that's going to be 2.060. Just like that, and menu to get back out. And now you can see that there's an indication if I touch the end of the beam and I load it, you can see that there's a response. But we need to zero this out because this indication right now really doesn't tell us anything. It's just an electrical offset. So now I'm going to press on the balance button and I'll press it again. And now we're zeroing these gauges out. So we're going to, we're going to zero them out and we'll tell it to save it. And now they're both at zero. So now for the very first time, we're going to put a load on the end of this beam and see what response we get. It should be something close to about a thousand microstrain. That's what I'm expecting. We can go through the math to get a little more accurate, but really I'm trying to compare the two gauges and see if they produce the same response. To make sure that there's no additional moments, I'm trying to make sure we get the weight right in the center and see if we can get it to stop oscillating. And it's still bouncing a little bit. See if we can get it to stop and settle out. So we were expecting about a thousand microstrain and we get right at it. Uh, channel 2 is 1,002, 1,003, and channel 1 is 1,009. We've given it a few minutes to settle so that the weight would quit bouncing. And you can see that the gauges are essentially telling us the same thing. They're right at 1,000. One's a touch higher than the other. Um, 
when you start thinking about reasons why, one of the first things you look at is what's the tolerance at which you know the gauge factor. And in this case, the gauge factor is a half percent typically. So there's a lot of reasons why in, in the real world, in a practical sense, you know, we uh, oftentimes accept a 5% measurement, but when you can control a lot of your variables, you can expect a tighter tolerance comparing the theory versus the experimental. And in general, in these exercises, we find that we get within about 1% of the calculated value. So these two gauges are basically tracking and telling us for all intents and purposes, for all practical reasons, really the same result. They're both very stable. Now that the weight has stopped oscillating, you'll notice the stability is excellent. And that's what we're looking for. When you're, when you're looking to determine how well your gauges are bonded, you want to look at stability under load. You also want to look at zero return. And you look at repeatability. If you put the weight on it three times, do you get the same result each time? So as we take the weight off, we get a count or two, and you could easily get that from the lead wire resistance. I'm going to balance that out one more time and we'll do it again. Let's try putting the weight on again. And it's going to be a little sensitive to where you position the weight as well. So if you get to one side or the other, Notice the repeatability is excellent. It's coming right back to the same spot. And if I take it off, we maybe have, we got one count that's probably the lead wire. I'll take and put it back on again. As you can see, the data keeps coming up to the same point, so the repeatability is excellent, and the zero return is excellent. So really the last step to complete this installation, we checked it out. We also checked it with the P3, and it seems to be both gauges are functioning excellent. Uh, we're excited about adding the new advanced sensor strain gauges into our uh, workshop. We've been looking at uh, increasing the resistance of uh, these strain gauges for quite a long time as we know that most customers use 350 ohm gauges or even higher and advanced sensors really allows us to be able to really push the limits on what can be produced in terms of resistance and size of the gauge. Uh, but this particular one is designed to match a 250 UW and we believe that you'll find it as a drop-in replacement as we've just seen. So the last step here is I'm gonna uh, apply some protective coating. We're gonna use the M-Coat uh, A, which is a polyurethane. It goes on very easy, it's easy to apply. It takes about 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes to be uh, tacked free where you can handle it. Uh, just like before, it comes in this absorbent material and I'm just gonna remove the packaging, cut that off, and then uh, there's also this white plastic seal that's on it. I'll just take that off. And again, this is the M Code A polyurethane. Uh, anytime you're using any of these materials, you want to check the expiration date. Uh, this one looks good. It's uh, up to March 2020. I'm going to take it, put it down, and before I apply the coating, I'm going to take another piece of paper drafting tape, and I'll just put it at the end of the strain gauges. This is just to make the, the coating look nice. I'll just kind of cover over the end of it like that. And then you're going to take the m -Code A, take the brush cap applicator out, and just start applying it. I normally start in and around the solder connections and you just sort of mop it in place. You want a good thick coating. There's a lot of solvent in it so it will, as it dries, it'll shrink. 
but just take it and kind of brush it on over top of the gauges. And I'm just going to coat the entire area between the uh, two pieces of tape. Just coat that whole area. And just again, just sort of mop it. Make sure you got a good thick coating in and around the solder connections. Brush a little bit up underneath the lead wire. And this is a a coating is very similar to conformal coatings that manufacturers use on printed circuit boards to protect them. But that's really it. Now I'll take that, close it up, we'll wait for it to dry, and then we're basically done. So we appreciate you taking the time to go through this exercise with us. Uh, here in the coming months we'll be transitioning over in our workshops to the advanced sensors, strain gauges, and the 350 ohm versions and we're excited about all the possibilities that the advanced sensor technology will offer us. We can really push the limits now both with respect to resistance of the strain gauge. Uh, some of these patterns can go up to like 10,000 ohms and even higher and also in the size. Um, we can really push the limits making the gauges smaller and smaller. So we're really excited about the technology and we're excited about bringing it into our strain gauge workshops. Thank you for taking the time with us.